Papua New Guinea's independence came at a time when the rest of the world was pushing for decolonization. On the African continent, other countries were speaking the same language, one that demanded the exit of colonial powers like France and Britain. You're with National Radio in Papua New Guinea in 1975, Independence Year. Papua New Guinea's independence push followed that of one of its closest Melanesian neighbors, Fiji. The leaders of that period, young, idealistic nationalists, demanded a transition from Australian colonial rule to self-government. The group was led by a former radio broadcaster and teacher, Michael Sumara. A lot of people in this country thought, oh, well, we wouldn't be able to do it. They were talking in terms of two or three decades, while I was talking in terms of a few years. One stayed in Australia, I said, oh, I don't see it, you know. I cut that myself with the Prime Minister. I think that's one of my quotations in Australian paper. Uh, I never thought, you know, by forming the first political party that we would be able to see, uh, see it through. But then when I know that I had a lot of support from young Papua New Guineans, I thought, well, I think we should be able to make it. When people sort of slammed me and said I was rather communistic-minded, I was rather pinkish or reddish, I was extremely left, um, that I was a man ahead of my time. I did not dream that I would be able to live through those turmoil that, uh, days to witness this. Papua New Guinea's vision was set out in 1973 when the Constitutional Planning Committee laid out a national focus that placed emphasis on the development of rural communities. The vision set in more detail when the early leaders wrote out the five national goals and directive principles. Integral human development, equality and participation, national sovereignty and self-reliance, natural resources and environment, and Papua New Guinean ways. The 1960s and 70s was a time when Papua New Guinea saw thriving agricultural industries in cocoa, coffee, and copper cooperatives flourished. While large-scale industry was viewed with skepticism, the development of large mines like the Bougainville Copper Mine and Oak Teddy paved way for economic development. An institution of much pride was the Papua New Guinea Defense Force, a small force but highly trained, carrying on a legacy of British and Australian influences. In 1980, Papua New Guinea, through the PNGDF, contributed to the decolonization of the Pacific sending an armed contingent to Port Villa as part of efforts to put down a rebellion and help Vanuatu become an independent nation. Papua New Guinea's growth as a nation was not unhindered and without challenges. By the late 1980s, landowner discontent boiled over, fueled by disagreements over environmental damage and royalties. A conflict that lasted a decade began on the island of Bougainville. After 10 years, the newly appointed commander of the Papua New Guinea Defense Force, Brigadier General Jerry Singerok, a Bougainville veteran himself who was wounded in the conflict, demanded the resignation of then Prime Minister Sir Julius Chan. His call stemming from the proposed use of African mercenaries on Bougainville to try to end the crisis. Being a country prone to the wrath of Mother Nature, 
Papua New Guinea's history has been marred with natural disasters. The Rabaul volcano buried an iconic tourist hub and displaced thousands of people. In 1998, the Itape tsunami that swept through the Sisano Lagoon killed more than 3,000 people. In 1994 and then in 2004, the Manam volcano erupted and forced the relocation of more than 5,000 Manam Islanders who continue to live in care centers to this day. Towards the turn of the century, Papua New Guinea's role as an international player and a growing political and economic power in the Pacific has become evident. Under the leadership of founding father Sir Michael Somare, Papua New Guinea pushed for recognition of its strategic importance as the world's third largest carbon sink. The government, through international channels, pushed for recognition of rainforests as a commodity in the emerging trade of carbon credits. PNG representatives proved a formidable force in international negotiations with global powers like the US and Australia. The close relationship between Papua New Guinea and Fiji was evident during the aftermath of the recent coup when the island nation was moving towards democratic elections. Papua New Guinea provided funding and other support to its neighbor, with Sir Michael Somare at the helm. There is no doubt that even in his later years, the elder statesman continues to play an important role in bridging relationships between the world and Pacific communities. Small island states are, are concerned about the way um, the uh, bigger countries have been uh, exercising their uh, rights and leaving a lot of our small islands um, out of discussions. Some of the most influential people who have shaped Papua New Guinea deserve a mention. Sir Julius Chan, former finance minister who later became prime minister. John Momis, who shaped important decisions that resulted in the provinces we now know. Sir John Caputin, who helped shape the foundation of the country, Sir Buri Kidu, the country's first Chief Justice, Sir Anthony Siaguru, lawyer and prominent anti-corruption activist, Sir Makere Morauta, the reformist Prime Minister who redesigned the country's financial legislations and systems, and prominent firebrands like Sir William Skate also known as the grassroots prime minister who successfully brokered the PNG government and the Bougainville leaders to a path towards lasting peace and reformation. <laughs> Following a landslide victory by the ruling People's National Congress party in 2012, Mr. O'Neill and his coalition have focused on ensuring that important sectors such as health and education were made accessible and affordable through highly subsidizing provision costs. More than a million children who did not go to school in 2012 are in classes today because of the government's free education policy. Since 2012, Infrastructure is now being built to enable small to medium enterprises to have access to markets in communities and towns throughout the country. In law and order, the Royal Papua New Guinea Constabulary is being modernized alongside a successful running program with the Australian Federal Police. In the minerals sector, upcoming projects have been testament to international companies recognizing PNG's potential for investment. Today, Papua New Guinea will be recognized and known as a country uh, that has, it means business. Country that promised something, it will happen, and it has happened today. This is a momentous occasion for Papua New Guinea, very special day for PNG. This project has highlighted many achievements for us. Roger that, Mr. Prime Minister. We will now proceed to load the first PNG LNG cargo. Total and Interroyal Corporation closed a revised sales and purchase agreement covering the Elk Antelope gas fields. And Nautilus Minerals entered Papua New Guinea with the first ever seabed mining project. 
For the first time in PNG history, the government is spending a record amount of funding at the district level. This has seen the level of government services being improved in PNG's remote communities. Since 2012, a record number of infrastructure investments have taken place throughout the country. And under the leadership of Prime Minister Peter O'Neill, PNG has become an active member of the global community. It has strengthened ties with various countries and diplomatic partners in efforts to ensure that they can be part of Papua New Guinea's growth. Papua New Guinea has triumphed both locally and internationally in sporting events that have defined us as a nation. In 1990, Papua New Guinea won gold for the first time at the Commonwealth Games. Gewa Tau winning the women's lawn balls finals in spectacular style. Penny! Yes! Papua New Guinea has taken gold! In 2006, another gold, this time in swimming. The success of generations of sportsmen and women over 40 years has been nothing short of remarkable. And as a testament to PNG's progress and development in the Pacific region, the hosting of the 15th Pacific Games in Port Moresby showed that Papua New Guinea had come of age. that we will officiate in the Pacific Games 2015. From its spectacular opening to the final medal tally count, Papua New Guinea showed that it was now a force in the regional sporting arena. Papua New Guinea's attraction as an investment destination continues to flourish. A landscape-changing project just launched by the Mineral Resources Development Corporation has shown that for the first time, local PNG resource landowner groups have collaborated to bring PNG, its first five-star hotel from Papua New Guinea's latest investor, the Hilton Group of Hotels. We are making an hands-on approach like never before, like never before. We are not in a position where we can say that, listen, we've got too much money now. Globally, we are price takers. When the copper prices change in London or New York, we have to meet that price. We can't say that, listen, we can't sell it to you at that price. We are price takers because it's based on supply and demand of the global market itself. That is why when we have our commodity prices going down, oil, gas, copper, gold, all our minerals and petroleum resources, their prices are down. That means our revenue is coming down as well. We have no choice but to manage it properly. 
This year, Papua New Guinea is hosting the 46th Pacific Islands Forum Leaders Summit. Papua New Guinea woman leader Dame Meg Taylor is at the helm of the PIF as Secretary General. And for the first time, the framework for Pacific regionalism process was used to set the agenda for the forum, ensuring that the views of the people of the Pacific were captured. To the people of Pacific, let me leave you with this final message. Your leaders recognize the challenges that face our country. We will continue to work together with a united voice to improving the lives of our people and certainly deliver prosperity to our region. It's, uh, it's great to be in PNG. This is the second time I've been here and it's great to be at the 46th Pacific Forum. Over the last 40 years, Papua New Guinea has grown and matured from finding its feet at independence to becoming a leader in the Pacific and an emerging force on the world stage. With our roots firmly planted in our cultures and traditions and our eyes set on progress and development, Papua New Guinea the people and Papua New Guinea the country is now looking to the future with purpose. Happy Independence, Papua New Guinea!